Hello, this is Jerry Morton. Welcome to my Finding My Way podcast. This is podcast number 44B, titled Advanced Infantry Training Begins. Podcast 34 through 61 are stories from the year of Army training I experienced. The training started in August 1966 and ended in June 1967. The stories are published in the book Reluctant Lieutenant from Basic to OCS in the 60s, which was published by Texas A&M University Press as a military history. Advanced Infantry Training Begins, Podcast 44B, is an account of Jerry's attempt to cope with unexpected events, such as lots of ammo to burn off, or a gift of free time, producing unintended results. It is recommended that you listen to the Army training stories in the order in which they are presented, so that you can appreciate the full contextual richness of the later stories. A good field of fire is important for the machine gun. You have to establish the weapon's firing zone. It is best to have a long, wide, level field to your front, with no trees or obstacles that advancing troops can hide behind. The tripod the machine gun sits on has bars and levers on it and a little wheel that spins. You can rig the thing so that you do not have to think too much to spray your field with fire. Once rigged, the weapon will only swing so far to the left or the right and will only elevate or depress the muzzle so far. This is particularly helpful for night firing. If the enemy is trying to sneak up on you at night, you do not have to see him. You just spray the whole area with the machine gun. Everything within the field of fire will be killed. Those blank areas not covered by the spray of machine gun bullets are picked up by other weapons. Rifle fire and grenade launchers and other automatic weapons are placed at the right spot so that nothing in front of the good guys can get through the field of fire. Firing the M60 was exhilarating. The M60 is a very accurate weapon. Every fifth round or so is a tracer round. It makes a red dot streak of burning phosphorus through the air so you can see where your bullets were going. They make your fire look like trails of fireworks traveling horizontally above the ground. It is very pretty, particularly at night. The sound of the gun going off and your forced concentration in controlling such power makes everything around you non-existent. It occupies your complete attention. Late one afternoon on the firing range, a couple of sergeants carrying a large ammo box full of clipped together belts of bullets ready to feed into the M60 stopped beside my station. Usually they gave you only 30 or 40 rounds to fire at a time. Once you fired those rounds at your designated target, your turn was over. It was always a disappointment to fire so few rounds after waiting such a long time for your turn. They had about 20 machine guns online. That meant we waited in long lines before we got the chance to shoot our 10 seconds worth of bullets. I was particularly pleased with my shot groups and shot bursts with the gun. It just seemed that I had a knack. With those rounds, I could adjust the weapon and fire it so that my initials were carved into the 55-gallon drums we were shooting at. I could feather squeeze the trigger so that only one round fired at a time, as with a repeat fire M14. That enabled me to control more of the rounds spitting out of the machine gun. 
I would initial my drum and then redirect my fire on someone else's drum and initial it too. A lot of guys just shot off all of their rounds in one big burst or had such trouble retargeting their weapons that they never shot off all of their allotted rounds. That produced a surplus of unfired bullets at the end of the day. Those surplus rounds were in the ammo box the sergeants had brought. He's the best shot. Let him fire him off, the sergeant standing behind me said as I turned and saw that he was pointing at me. Here, burn off these rounds, one of the sergeants said, handing my loader the box of ammo. Whoa, this is going to be fun, I thought. After the first rounds were placed in the automatic feeder slot, I slammed down the plate on the top, which locked the railroad tracks of the ammo belt into the gun. Short burst! Short burst! Remember to fire and short burst, said the supervising sergeant, as he motioned for me to fire downrange. I was in my own world. Nothing existed but the gun and me. I was really zeroed in. My target barrel rocket. I was playing tic-tac-toe on it. I squeezed off more rapid firing to draw the horizontal line showing that I had won. More ammo flew into the machine gun. It just kept firing. I spun the wheel on the horizontal controller that turned the barrel within the wide range of fire. I took on another 50-gallon drum. The bullets kept coming. The ammo belt seemed unending. The stream of tracers burned their way across the open space. I thought it would be neat to see how close I could come to the base of the drums without hitting them. Dust flew up in front of them and arched around their bases, following the natural curve of their placement on the ground. Still the bullets came. I switched to ricocheting the bullets off the ground into the drums and rotating from one drum to another in an X pattern. Damn, it was fun. Pong, 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 went my helmet. Lifting my finger from the trigger and turning my head, I heard nothing except for the screaming of the sergeant. His voice sounded small and puny in contrast to the continuous roar of the machine gun. Cease fire, cease fire, he screamed. The barrel, you're overheating the barrel. I looked at it. Smoke rose from its entire length. No doubt about it. It was hot. The shimmering heat waves rising from it. The smell of burning oil and the rising smoke told you that any flesh that touched it would be instantaneously cooked. I looked around. Every gun on the line was silent. Every eye was on me. No one was talking. It had been a hell of a show. Nice shooting, son. Just remember the barrel. You don't want to burn it up. The sergeant said under his breath as he motioned for me to leave the weapon. Friday morning, we were told that those of us who passed Saturday morning inspections, without a mistake, could get off post Saturday night. It would be an overnight pass. The rest of the company would receive an on-post pass. As best I could tell, only four guys got through Saturday morning's inspection without a mistake being found. To my surprise, I was one of them. The guy in the bunk across from mine was the only fellow I personally knew who got one. He had some relatives living near Anniston. They would pick him up at the fort's main entrance that evening. It was a family affair. We both knew it would be inappropriate for him to invite me to go along. There was no place I knew of to go. I might go downtown and see a movie, but that was it. Without Anna, what was the point of going off post? It would be a waste of money to sleep overnight in a motel just because I could. Besides, I could not go to sleep in a motel. It was not my home. I would feel out of place there. The barracks were my home if I was not with Anna. My off-post pass began at noon. The first thing I needed to do was to go to the PX. 
get a pocket full of change and call Anna. We made plans to meet in Atlanta two weekends later. I assumed that I would get the three-day pass as they had promised. If the Army changed its mind after Anna bought her plane tickets, we would just be out the money. She would make all of the hotel arrangements. Five of us guys had made plans to drive to Atlanta. They all had relatives or friends there. One guy had someone who would drop off a car for him to pick up in Anniston. We would share the cost of gas. They were kind enough to agree to drive me to the airport. Anna and I would meet there as we had in Philadelphia. It was great to talk with her for that hour and a half. She was happy about my off-post pass and hoped I would see a good movie in town. Feeling really good as I left the telephone booth in the PX, I bought a copy of the Aniston Star. It did not reveal much. There was one movie house downtown. There just did not seem to be much to Aniston, and even less going on there. Looking up from the paper, my eye fell onto an old acquaintance from Basic. Stone had been in a different platoon than mine. Our paths had crossed several times in basic. He was okay. Stone never said much. He did not miss much. While he was about as tall as I was, he had me in weight by a good 20 pounds. None of that weight was fat. Stone was solid muscle. You knew, just by looking at him, that you did not want to mess with this guy. His disposition was pleasant enough. He would smile with his eyes before a slow grin would grow on his straight face. I did not know much about him or his background. The thinning hair and a few permanent wrinkles around his eyes suggested that he was older than I was. Perhaps he had worked on construction jobs outdoors and been aged by the sun. His physical build fit that of a man who made his living with his strength. He was going to field artillery in OCS. I assumed he was one of the college guys, but I did not know it for a fact. He seemed more mature and somewhat older than the fresh graduates from college. If he was a college graduate, I doubted that he went to an Ivy League school. His accent was definitely Midwestern. If he wanted to tell me about himself, that was fine. And if he did not, that was also okay. Out in the field, it did not make all that much difference. If you were a pain in the behind... That was the reality. How you got that way did not much matter to those who had to cope with you. Being a fool or someone you could depend upon was what you were, not who you were. You could count on Stone. What's up with you? Stone asked, looking at me with those smiling eyes. I got an overnight pass with no place to go and no one to go with, I said laughing and shaking my head. Hey, I'll go with you, Stone said with a smile that matched those eyes. Great, what what and where, I responded, pointing at the paper. Hell, I don't know. We'll go get us a good meal, find a couple of good bars, and just hang out. Stone blurted out, grabbing the paper from my hands. I thought I might catch a ride downtown and walk around just to reconnoiter the place. Maybe catch a movie. I don't want to stay overnight in a hotel. I said as we were walking out of the PX. Sounds like a good start. I'll meet you back here in an hour in my civvies. Then we can catch a cab to go town. He said as he started walking away from me. Great. Here in an hour, I shouted. As the distance was quickly growing between us, things were looking up. 
this was shaping up into an all-around good day. Even though we were in our civilian clothes, anyone seeing us would know that we were Army. Our short GI haircuts were a dead giveaway. Then our excellent physical condition and the shadows under our eyes from lack of sleep were the next obvious clues. The fact that our civvies were somewhat too big was another hint as to our status. The intense training had our body weight either down or distributed differently in the natural conversion of loose body fat into lean muscle. But the most obvious tip to our military status was our shoes. No one in civilian life wears black, spit-shine military dress shoes. Our civilian dress made us look more unusual and ultimately military than if we had been in our army fatigues. We would have felt more comfortable in the fatigues. I had thought that Anison was a big city, judging by the size and configuration of its downtown district. It was a simple, small, southern town. On the main street were a movie theater, department store, hardware store, country diner, hotel, and small specialty shops. The main streets were all in orange, brick-faced buildings. A few of the side streets contained similar buildings. That seemed to be it. Residential homes on streets lined with shade trees seemed to be surrounding the downtown district in all directions. As a kid traveling through various towns in the Midwest, I would judge the size of a town by the number of movie theaters it had. Really small towns had only one movie house. It was not a town without at least one movie theater. It was a village. Neither Stone nor I knew anything about the movie. That was okay. It was a movie. We had not seen it, so we went. The film was definitely of pulp quality. A mystery designed to play as a second feature at the drive-in. Both of us were bored. If it were not for the fact that we had been denied the opportunity of seeing a movie, we would have left in the middle of it. As it was, we got a few good laughs by making fun of it. We were two of five people watching the late afternoon flick. When we left the theater, it was about 5.30. No one was on the street. No cars were on the road. It was as if the town was deserted. Stone wanted to find a bar. It was okay with me. We walked up and down the street. Everything was closed. There weren't even any closed bars. One small diner was open. It did not have any customers in it. We checked out a few of the side streets without success. The waitress in the diner was pleasant. She asked us how the army was treating us. That brought a good laugh from both of us. We sat down at a dimly lit corner table near the big picture window fronting the street. Stone told me to go ahead and order for him. He said he was going to go downtown toward the hotel and play out an idea he had. That was fine with me. When he got back, the waitress was placing our plates on the table. Meatloaf, mashed potatoes with gravy, green beans, tossed salad in a dinner roll with a pat of margarine and coffee. When the waitress left, Stone, displaying his big smile, pulled up his shirt to reveal two whiskey pints stuck in his pants. The town's dry. I had to pay ten dollars for each pint. There are no bars anywhere. He stated with a hint of mischief in his eyes. But, he said with emphasis, there are a few spots where the good old boys gather on Saturday nights out in the woods. We can hit them later. 
Let's do it. It's better than going back to the barracks or sipping 3.2 beer, I said as I grabbed my water glass and held it under the table in response to Stones pulling out a whiskey pint and motioning to me for the glass. Hell, this was like being a teenager all over again. I didn't have to worry about where to eat or sleep. The Army took care of that. All I had to do for the Army was my chores. They did all of the thinking for me. They drove me to school. They made sure I had the right supplies and clothes. When they weren't there to tell me what to do, I could do what I damn well wanted to do. As long as I didn't break too many of the Army rules and didn't get into trouble with the law. I could be as irresponsible as I wanted to be. Since I was so strong and so well-trained, I could handle any of the good old boys that wanted to be nasty. Well, I could handle the situation as long as Stone was with me. Anyway, everyone was pretty nice to Army recruits. My best opinion on the matter was that most likely no one would mess with us. I felt the alcohol right away. The whiskey burned my throat going down and flushed my face. I felt invigorated. We laughed louder and longer at stupider and stupider comments we would throw out at each other. This was really enjoyable. Time to leave, Stone said. It was dark outside. We left the waitress a large tip. She stayed behind the lunch counter most of the time we were there. Whenever our water glasses were emptied, she would come over and fill them. As we drank more and more, we became sloppy about hiding the pints. She knew we were drinking, but was good enough not to comment. We had consumed about half of our little bottles. Stone said that a taxi driver would know where the action was. We just needed to get a cab. We asked the waitress for the number of a cab company. She volunteered to call one for us. Ten minutes later, we were entering a cab. Where you boys want to go? The cabbie asked over his shoulder. Just drive us around a little and show us the town, Stone replied. You boys new to the area? He required as he pulled away from the curb. Yeah, we're out of the fort. This is my first time in Alabama, I replied, leaning on the back of the front seat so he could hear me better. Fuck the army, the cabbie shouted and laughed. We laughed with him. So you've been in, I stated with a big grin. Hell yeah. They stuck me in during Korea. If my ass hadn't been frozen about as hard as a rock, I damn well have gotten it shot off when the comments sent in all those Chinese troops. Gee, that was a tough one, Stone said, jumping in. I heard we almost lost that one when the Chinese came storming down from the north. You're damn right about that. Yes, sir, son. Fortunately, the U.S. Army had two things going for it he said as he looked at us in the rearview mirror. What was that, I dutifully asked. Grinning from ear to ear, he turned his head to look at us as we sped down the road. They had me there to kick some butt, and the Chinese armory was just a little more fucked up than ours. We roared with laughter. This guy was all right. How are they treating you up there? He asked, jerking his head in the general direction of the base. They keep us out on training exercises late at night. You don't get much sleep. The vines and stickers in the bushes are bad, Stone responded. This uh, Vietnam thing is getting pretty bad. It might get as big as Korea if we're not careful. The taxi driver said with authority, It was pitch dark outside. Stone said, We'll have to go back to the base shortly if we can't find a good night spot. This place is 
pretty dead on Saturday nights, all right. The driver agreed. Stone leaned up close to the guy's ear and said, You wouldn't know where there was a night spot we could go to that has some beer and music. This, uh, this here's a dry town and county. There just ain't much going on around here, the cabbie said, shaking his head. The hell you say, Stone said with a big smile. There's got to be a gathering place somewhere that you could take us to. The driver said in a lowered voice, Well, I do know one place, but it's pretty rough. I knew it, I knew it, crowed Stone. Take us, take us to it. Uh, it's, it's pretty rough, man. It's really out of, out of dirt road deep in the woods. Most cabbies are afraid to drive out there. I could drive you near it, but I wouldn't drive right up to it. You'd have to walk down a cut-off dirt road another half mile, he said with his eyes darting from stone to me in the rearview mirror. That's it, that's it, shouted Stone, slapping his knee. Let's go, good party time is a-wasting. We drove what seemed to be a long time down a narrow two-lane road and then turned off onto a dirt road. It was bumpy and dusty. The noise of the road vibrations kept us from having much of a sustained conversation. About 15 minutes down the dirt road, Tall pine trees hemmed us in tightly to the narrow road. The cab began to slow down. Putting his right arm out on the top ridge of the front seat, the cabbie turned to look at both of us in the eyes. Boys, no cab driver will come out here to pick you up late at night. This is just too rough a place. Bringing the cab to a stop, he pulled out a pencil and paper from the glove compartment and said, I'm a going to give you my name and telephone number. When you're ready to be picked up, you call this number and ask for me. Tell them you're the two army guys I dropped off. I know it's you. You wait right here on this road. See where that little dirt road cuts off down there to the right? That's where I'll be looking for you. I won't stop unless I see you there. Yeah, you be there or you don't get picked up. Got it? Yeah, thanks a lot, I said. Stone echoed my appreciation. We just walked down the cutoff there, I asked. Stone was already three-quarters of the way out of the cab. Yeah, it's about a ten-minute walk down there to that place, he said quietly. What do we owe you, I asked, reaching for my wallet. Oh, uh, how about uh, just paying for the gas it took to get you here, he answered. Ah. Uh, that's awful nice, I said, handing him two bucks. Stone stuck his head back in the cab. It sure is, he agreed. Oh, us infantry have to stick together, the cabbie said with a smile and gunned the motor. A sweeping cloud of dust trailed behind him. Stone and I stood there on the dirt road, hands in our pockets, watching his taillights disappear into the darkness. We looked at each other for a long moment. In unison, we broke the spell by shrugging at each other. We turned and started walking down the middle of the cut-off road. At first, we couldn't see anything except tall tree trunks. They were so thick and deep that it was just one dark line on top of other dark black lines. There seemed no break in them. As we progressed down the road, we could hear music. It was Aretha Franklin kind of music. Then a clearing in the trees appeared. The clearing grew. 
the headlights and taillights of cars backing up or slowly moving into parking spaces illuminated the area. There was a large, windowless cinder block building in the middle of the open space. It had one of those British type guardhouse shaped entrances. You know, like the one you see on television when those guards at the Royal Palace in London stand there at attention with the big black beaver hats on and American tourists trying to make him smile. He's always standing in front of his little guardhouse. Well, his guardhouse is here, in these woods. You go through it to get into the cinder block building. People were moving from the cars to the guardhouse. A couple of guys here, a man and a woman holding hands there. All of the people seemed to be moving from the edge of the woods to the center of the clearing in the guardhouse entrance. A turning car's headlight scanned the moving crowd. We were moving toward the guardhouse. The light momentarily illuminated everyone, instantly. Stone and I knew why the cabbie had said this was such a bad place. The people were all black. Neither one of us had to say anything. This had the potential of being bad. We looked at each other as we continued our strides toward the door. We were committed. We were going inside. I stepped into the guardhouse first. Pow! Something hit both of my shoulders at the same time. I was slammed up against the wall. My captor had me pinned against it. His hands were pressing back on my shoulders. Two other large black men were in my face. Quickly looking up, I could see stone in the same position, pressed against the opposite wall. Someone else ran his hands up my pants legs. He felt around my crotch. Then he ran his hands up both sides of my waist. I felt the half-empty pint bottle being efficiently removed from his protective spot in front of my belly button. A hand held it up to my face. A deep voice from a form standing between the two groups pinning Stone and me to the wall said, Five dollars to get in. Five dollars a piece to bring in the pints. Multiple hands released me from their grip. I reached for my billfold in my back pocket. Stone was doing the same. It was very quiet. No one moved. We were blocking the doorway. A long line of people were waiting outside, anxious to get in. What brings you boys here? The voice in the shadows asked. Before I could respond, Stone shouted, Fuck the army! While displaying the happiest of grins I'd ever seen on his face. That brought a spontaneous roar of laughter from our captors and me. They slapped us on the back in good cheer and took our money, opened the inner door. We walked inside. The place was jumping. On stage was a six or seven piece band, a female vocalist, and two go-go girls bathed in ultraviolet light shimmering and shaking to the blaring music. The dance floor was crowded with people twisting and shouting. They were having a good time. Off to the left, a bartender was serving beer. Ten-cent bags of pretzels and potato chips hung overhead. In the far corner by the bar was a pinball machine. The bar was fairly well lit. The dance floor and stage were dark. A few tables were scattered here and there against the walls of the dancing area. Most of the people were standing or dancing. There were so many people in the place it wasn't feasible for anyone to be sitting, as far as I could tell. Stone and I immediately went to the bar to get some beer. As we walked up to it, I noticed that we were being shadowed by two very large black men. Each of them was capable of picking Stone or me up and tucking one of us under each arm to carry around for display purposes. It was clear to us that we had better not step out of line or we would be squashed in short order. A casual glance around the place made it clear that we were the only white people in attendance. 
there weren't going to be any white boys joining us. Holding our bottles of beer, Stone and I returned to the edge of the dancing crowd. Our shadows moved with us. Stone began dancing by himself, moving to the music. I joined him. Any inappropriate behavior on our part would be bad. We had to keep from making anyone mad. One thing was for sure. We had better not look at, talk to, or do anything else to interact with the women. That could provoke a disaster. We stayed absorbed with the music and our dancing. We shouted and applauded with everyone else at the end of the band's various songs, sipping our beer, dancing, or just standing in our little space listening to the music seemed to be safe enough. From time to time, someone would move around or through our little space. A few of the men would pause and ask, what are you doing here? Fuck the army, was our constant response. Oh yeah, man, right on. Or some similar response would come back with a friendly smile as the communicator drifted away. Whenever Stone or I would return to the bar or go to the bathroom, our shadows would follow us. Dancing most of the night away works up a sweat. Sweating works up a thirst for beer. We drank a lot of beer. I was feeling it. Somehow, we had managed to consume all our whiskey. The bartender took the empty bottles. He never spoke more than a few words at a time to us. What do you want? Another beer? That's two more dollars. Seemed to be the limit of what he was willing to say to us. Our shadows never spoke. They never got close enough to speak to us. Sometimes I wondered if they weren't keeping people away from us more than they were watching to catch us make trouble. I actually didn't think too much about it. I was just aware that they were always watching. During one of our many trips to the bar, I asked Stone, When do you have to be back to the barracks? Anytime I want, he said with a sly grin. His answer did not make sense to me. My weekend pass was pretty specific. I had to return to post by 6 p.m. Sunday. I pressed the issue. No, Stone, I mean, when is your weekend pass over? I don't have a pass. I just decided to give myself a holiday, he said matter-of-factly. Oh, no, I thought. Stone is AWOL, absent without leave. Gee whiz, how do I get myself into these things? Well, nothing has happened so far. All we have to do is get back on post and get Stone to his company. If he gets in trouble with his sergeants, that's his business, I reasoned. The momentary stress left me. Late into the evening, while Stone and I were at the bar getting another beer, I told Stone, I'm ready to go back to the barracks. I'm really tired. I've got to get some sleep. I want to play some pinball first, he said, walking over to the machine. Okay, but I got to sit down or lie down. I'm beat, I replied. Putting a quarter into the machine, Stone said, Fine, fine, sit down. I'll be done in a little while. I looked around. There was no place to sit. The bar had no seats. I could see no chairs, period. People were everywhere. The only place there were no people was under the pinball machine. Without hesitation, I crawled between Stone's feet and sat beneath the machine. He was really into the game. He would pound on the sides of the machine in an attempt to assist the pinball in finding the right slot to roll through, a bumper light to ricochet off of. 
I was safe under the pinball machine. There was no risk of being stepped on. This was an excellent idea, I thought, as I stretched out on the floor and put my arm under my head for a pillow. I would just catch a few minutes of sleep. No, I was wrong. It was too noisy. The floor was too hard. No matter how I twisted, turned, or positioned my body, I could not find a comfortable position. Finally, I gave up. I crawled out from under the protective border of Stone's two feet and the four legs of the pinball machine. Come on, Stone, it's time to go, I stated matter-of-factly. Okay, let's go call the cabbie, he said as we walked to the end of the bar near the payphone. We both emptied our pockets of their change onto the top of the bar. Neither of us could find a dime in the mess of coins. We constantly rearranged the pile but failed in our goal. It was frustrating. We laughed at each other as we carefully moved coins from one side of the pile to the other. A voice from behind us asked, You boys ready to go back to the barracks? We turned in unison and said yes with surprise and relief in our voice at the insight displayed by the question. The speaker was one of our shadows. All right then, we'll get you back to the fort, he said, motioning for us to follow. Stone and I scooped up our coins and looked at him with expectant faces. He motioned to a couple of other men. They came forward and without a word ushered us to a door behind the bar. I had failed to notice it before. The door opened to display a large white stretch limousine. They opened the rear door for us. As I was ducking my head to get in, the voice said, Once you're on post, tell the driver where your barracks are. With that, the door closed and we were off. When we drove through the main gate, the driver turned his head to speak through the little hole created in the glass wall separating us by a sliding glass window. Where are your barracks? I did not know. I had no idea how to get to them. I had never entered the fort this way before. Stone was no help. He could not keep himself from chuckling about something. The driver decided to slowly drive throughout the base, hoping we would spot our barracks. After several extremely slow passes, by identical buildings in different locations, I finally made mine out. I could tell it by its location and relation to the barracks on the hill that the National Guard guys were in and in the location of the company armory. With my barracks as an anchor point, we drove around looking for Stone's barracks. I had never been to his barracks. I had no clue as to where it was. Neither did Stone. It slowly became obvious to me that Stone had been drinking just a bit too much beer to be of help. The wondering ended when I suggested that Stone spend the night in my barracks. I remembered that the guy on the top bunk across from mine had also gotten a pass. He was the one staying overnight with relatives, I seem to remember. Stone could sleep in his bunk. The guy was a decent enough sort. He would not mind someone sleeping in his bunk just one night. In the morning light, Stone would be able to find his barracks without too much difficulty, we reasoned. I was really tired. We thanked the driver. He drove quietly off into the night. After showing Stone the bunk he was to sleep in, I quickly stripped down to my underwear and crawled into bed. It was close to noon when I woke up. Stone had already left. I smoothed out the sheets he had slept under and went to lunch. When I got back to the barracks, I started preparing my gear for the next day. 
we were going camping. The sergeants had said that we were going to be sleeping out under the stars for several days playing war games. We needed to put underwear, socks, poncho, toilet gear, and the like into our packs. Our web belt needed to have a faux canteen, entrenching tool, and ammo pouches attached to it. Monday morning, we would be issued some sea rations, pick up our weapons, and be trucked out to our disembarkation point. As I was sitting on the side of my bunk, working on the web belt, the guy from the bunk across the aisle approached me. Hey, they said you let somebody sleep in my bunk last night, he said with real tension in his voice. Oh, yeah, uh, he was lost, couldn't find his barracks. Uh, I don't didn't know what else to do. I was hoping you wouldn't mind, I said with concern in my voice. He did not appear to be happy at all. Well, he began with a sigh. He crawled between the sheets with his dirty shoes on. My sheets are filthy. Oh, that's bad. That's really bad. I, I was mortified to hear that. I, I'm truly sorry. You can use my sheets. They're not that dirty. We can trade. I said, and I meant every word. Damn, that stone. He knew better than that. He must have drunk more than I had figured to do that. We would not be getting clean sheets until we came back from the field. Trading sheets with the guy was the least I could do. I was really sorry. Nah, that's okay, he said, standing over me. I just didn't know if you knew what was up. I, I'm so sorry this happened to you. It's a long story. But the guy badly needed a bunk to sleep in. He, he, it's okay. I just wanted you to know, he said as he walked briskly away from me.